Um, after that, uh, 1999, you were dropped by Virgin. Um, why is that? What happened there? Uh, because I'm dancehall and reggae, and the minute you don't have one, they think you're done. You know, I had hit straight up until that one album, and it was just luck. The day my single was released was the very same day that Princess Diana died, and wow. the radios just stopped playing everything at that point. And the only record that was played at that point was Candle in the Wind by Elton John. What's good? It's your boy DJ T Stomp out here with Comp Hits. And today I'm starting a new series called What Happened To. And we're kicking it off with the dance hall legend Shaggy. Shaggy is one of the most iconic artists of the early 2000s. His voice is very distinguishable. And he brought dance hall to another level, making hit records while still being authentic to the sound. You know why you click the title of the video. Let's get into it. Shaggy was born Orville Richard Burrell on October 28, 1968 in Kingston, Jamaica. He was raised by his mother and grandmother in Raytown, which was one of the birthplaces of dancehall, the genre Shaggy would later take to new heights. When he was a teenager, he saw a Jamaican star named Yellow Man perform, and in true Caribbean fashion, Yellow Man arrived to the show and performed his set very late, but the crowd was still highly anticipating him. Shaggy saw the way he excited the crowd, and when the show was finished, Shaggy knew exactly what he wanted to do with his life. Shaggy is just another example that early discovery leads to early mastery. Despite growing up in Jamaica and listening to early reggae, dancehall, and calypso, Shaggy was well aware of different types of music. Growing up, his grandmother would be exposing him to jazz music from Nat King Cole and country music from Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers. Shaggy would start to learn about music theory and writing as he would practice singing with his friends locally and studying the music scene. When he was a teenager, he left Jamaica and moved in with his mother in Brooklyn, New York. He went to Erasmus Hall High School, and while in school, he gained a lot of attention when he would rhyme. As you probably guessed, Shaggy got his name from Scooby-Doo. Eventually, he would be noticed and would do records with a New York producer named Don Juan. Despite the on-paper success... Shaggy was struggling in New York. While his records were hitting the local charts, there wasn't much money in the Caribbean music scene at the time. Shaggy spent a year trying to lock down stable employment, but he had no luck. For example, he had a job at Baskin Robbins, but he only lasted one day. And when he was working, he noticed a beautiful woman walk in and order ice cream. And in Shaggy's mind, he felt he was going to have no luck getting girls wearing the Baskin Robbins uniform. I worked at Baskin Robbins for a day. And it was this really, really cute chick that came in there and she wanted ice cream and I was conservative and it was just nothing sexy about that apron on that hat, man. Shaggy was also beginning to hang with the wrong crowds in bad areas and he felt like the only way he could make money was through illegal means. Shaggy came to his senses and realized he needed to get out of the streets and he did so by joining the U.S. Marines in 1988. He spent over three years in the Marines and served in the first Gulf War as a field artillery cannon crewman. The highest rank he ever achieved was Lance Corporal, but he was reduced in rank multiple times during his career, and for Shaggy, the Marine Corps was a life-changing experience. While Jamaica and the streets of New York made him tough, the Marine Corps made him disciplined and the lessons learned carried on into his music career. I joined the military, was at the time, I was a kid in Brooklyn and really needed to get off the streets. I was with a lot of people that I shouldn't be with, and uh, military changed my life. Some say I went in the military to learn how to fire a gun, but the streets taught me that. I went into the military to learn how to balance my checkbook. There's so much things I do in life right now that I've learned just by being in the military and I couldn't have done if I wasn't in the military. One thing to note was that while in the Marine Corps, Shaggy didn't completely throw in the towel on his music. While he was in the States, he spent most of his time in North Carolina and would travel to New York as frequently as he could to record. The inconvenience paid off because Shaggy was heating up and during those studio sessions, Shaggy would develop his iconic voice. Shaggy was taking music seriously, and while he was in the military, he would still continue to dominate the early New York reggae scene. His early records, Mumpy, would hit number one on the New York reggae charts. In 1992, Shaggy would leave the Marine Corps and get back to his music career full-time, and things continued going very well. Another record of his, Big Up, would once again hit number one on the New York reggae charts. Shaggy's success started going beyond local, and he was picking up steam in other cities like London and Miami. And on March 22, 1993, Shaggy would release his next big record, O Carolina, and this record would officially bring his music career to the next level. It was immediately a hit, and he caught the attention of Greensleeve Records, a label with whom he would do a distribution deal with. 
He eventually signed to Virgin Records for over a million dollars, and Old Carolina would peak at number 59 on the Billboard Hot 100, which was a monumental moment for Caribbean music. Shaggy's life had officially changed. With some of the money, he bought his mother a house, and he told himself even if he can't make another hit, he has some property, money, and he's young enough to where he can start another business. Luckily for Shaggy, he would never have to exercise that option. Shaggy would end up releasing his debut album, Pure Pleasure, on July 30th, 1993. The album would see some minor chart success in European countries, but it wasn't that big, which was expected as it was early in Shaggy's career and Caribbean music wasn't as palatable for non-West Indian audiences. The next year, Shaggy would release another album called Original Doberman, but this album had a little bit of a catch to it. The records on the album were old records that Shaggy recorded years prior, and as expected, the album saw no commercial success and wasn't well liked. Even at that time, the music sounded dated. Shaggy was far past where he was when he recorded those records talent-wise. The album was also an attempt by Greensleeve Distribution to just cash in on Shaggy's early success. Now, Shaggy's next hit record would completely eclipse everything he did in his career thus far. On June 5th, 1995, Shaggy would release Boombastic. Now, the success of this song was insane. It was a very obvious Jamaican dancehall record that debuted at number one on the UK charts and in the US peaked at number three on the Billboard Hot 100. Shaggy was now officially a household name, and very shortly after, on July 11th, 1995, Shaggy would release an album under the same title, and the album would see a lot of success. It sold 20,000 copies in the first week, which might seem low if you're knowledgeable about music stats, but you have to remember this was the 90s and Jamaican dancehall was a new genre at the time. American consumers weren't used to it and major labels didn't really know what to do with it or how to market it. Shaggy would end up getting a Grammy as Boombastic received a Grammy for the best reggae album. Shaggy felt he was doing so well he knew he was going to win the Grammy because he felt he was just so far ahead of this competition. Currently, Boombastic is certified platinum, but the certification hasn't been updated since 1995, so it's safe to assume that Shaggy has sold way more. The next year, Shaggy would continue with his mainstream success as he once again made it to the Billboard Top 40, but this time as a feature on Maxi Priest's hit record, That Girl. Now, unfortunately, over the next few years, things would slow down for Shaggy, and he would end up in a rough patch. In 1997, Shaggy released his next album called Midnight Lover and things didn't go well. The album rolled out around the death of Princess Diana and radio stations didn't want to play his upbeat dancehall music and as a result the album sales suffered. His records Peace of My Heart featuring Marsha and Love Me Love Me featuring Janet would chart on the Hot 100 but not at very good spots and the success was nowhere near where it was years prior. Now, unfortunately, in 1999, Virgin Records would drop Shaggy despite the success he gave them initially. Now, Shaggy also learned a lesson when it came to the music business here. Shaggy's management did what seemed like the obvious thing to do. While they were signed to Virgin Music, Virgin Music would give them cash advances to make music and Shaggy was always successful enough to pay them back and then some. This means that in 1999, when they dropped Shaggy, it was easy because he didn't owe them anything and they were just happy collecting royalties from the past few projects he already gave them. The label had no obligation to pour more money into Shaggy's career. Now, Shaggy believes that years prior when he renegotiated with them, his management should have asked for way more money than they did. That way he would be in the red with the label and the label would be focusing on his career and working harder to make him an even bigger artist so they could recoup. Regardless, this wouldn't stop Shaggy. Shortly after being released by Virgin Records, Shaggy would sign a new deal with MCA Records. Shaggy would also return to Jamaica. He lived in a small Kingston apartment where he would wake up every morning, eat porridge and beef patties, and write music all day. This is also where he would write his next few big records, and thanks to Shaggy's persistence, his career would reach new heights. With MCA, Shaggy would release his next new album, Hot Shot, and the rollout for this album was insane. The first promotional single for this album was Shaggy's biggest song of all time, It Wasn't Me featuring Rick Rock. Now Shaggy claims that this record's diamond, but I couldn't find any RIAA certifications to justify that, though it very well could be eligible for diamond. The song would peak at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 on February 3rd, 2001. Now the story behind this record is really cool. Shaggy was a fan of Eddie Murphy and he watched a comedy special of his where he joked about the subject matter. 
When asked about it, Shaggy said, the thing about it wasn't me is that the subject matter is so relatable. It's either you're banging, you know somebody is banging, or you wish you were banging. Somebody banging, some banging is going on. Later on, Shaggy would link up with Eddie Murphy in the Bahamas, and Eddie Murphy even joked with Shaggy saying that he should be receiving royalties for the record. The next promotional single would also go number one. This was Angel featuring Raven, which on March 30th, 2001, peaked at number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Shaggy ended up getting to perform Angel and It Wasn't Me at Michael Jackson's 30th anniversary. Hot Shot released on August 8th, 2000, and this album dominated the charts. The album was number one on the Billboard Top Album Sales chart for six weeks, but ended up spending a total of 84 weeks on the chart. Despite releasing in 2000, it was the second highest selling album of 2001, selling 4.5 million copies that year. Shaggy was just edged out by Linkin Park, whose album Hybrid Theory sold just 300,000 more copies. Once again, you do have to remember that the popularity of rock and the popularity of Jamaican dancehall aren't even comparable. Lastly, the album is currently six times platinum, but the certification hasn't been updated since 2001. So if Shaggy were to update it in 2023, this album could very well be diamond. With Hot Shot, Shaggy was on top of the world, but unfortunately, Shaggy's popularity would immediately decline. In 2002, Shaggy dropped his sixth album, Lucky Day, but the sales weren't what he or the label anticipated. None of the records from the album would see any commercial success, and the sales didn't go that well. Shaggy also ran into another business issue. When Shaggy originally signed to MCA after leaving Virgin Records, MCA was struggling to keep the lights on, but the success of Hot Shot was enough to keep them afloat. However, when Lucky Day flopped, the label went under and was absorbed by Geffen Records, and in 2005, Shaggy released Close Drop, which sold even worse and generated less attention than Lucky Day. By the end of 2005, Shaggy realized that trying to make mainstream dancehall music was just going to continue giving him diminishing returns, so he started doing things a little differently. Shaggy knew he had several undeniable records, so he used those as a means to tour, and he toured a lot. He did shows and clubs appearances throughout the world, and he's still doing this consistently today. Musically, he also started collaborating with more artists from back in the Caribbean, including Rupe and Sizzla. And in 2007, he did drop another album called Intoxication that once again didn't make a lot of noise, but that was mostly because it was aimed at a Caribbean audience. In the early 2010s, Shaggy would once again make an aggressive attempt at a musical comeback. He would do songs with Mr. Vegas, Movado, Sean Kingston, and he even reunited with Raven and Rick Rock who are features on his two biggest hits. However, it was obvious that Shaggy's current success would always be compared to the success he saw in the early 2000s. Shaggy would continue with touring and putting out music here and there for the next several years, but in 2015, he actually saw a slight resurgence. In 2015, Shaggy released a record called I Need Your Love featuring Mahombe, Fady, and Costi, which would bring Shaggy back to the Billboard Hot 100 as the record would peak at number 66. A couple years later, he also got the opportunity to do the Boom Boom remix with Popcon and Cardi B. Shaggy, someone who never really got into any public issues in his career, would also end up in some drama with Rihanna. In 2019, word got around that Rihanna was working on her next album, R9, and in early 2020, Shaggy did an interview with Daily Star where he is quoted saying, They approached me for the Rihanna project, yeah, there's a lot of great people involved, but for me, I didn't need to audition to be on the record. I'll leave that to the younger guys, but from what I hear, it should be good. The way the fans interpreted this, but you can't blame them because of how Shaggy said it, was that Rihanna was trying to make Shaggy audition, which as successful as Rihanna is, if any dance artist is going to be above that, it'd be Shaggy, especially because he paved the way for her early records to succeed like Ponda Replay. Shortly after, a spokesperson from Rihanna's team would respond to Shaggy's comments on the Jamaican radio station Irie FM saying, We are working on an album, not a talent show, so why would Rihanna require Shaggy or any other artist to audition? After Rihanna had already gathered all the material for the album, Shaggy contacted her asking to be a part of the album. She explained to him that the album was pretty much completed and they were just working on mixing, mastering, and deciding which songs to actually use. However, she invited him to submit some material so she could see if it fits with the flow of the album. That was by no means asking for an audition, it was more going out of her way to get him on the album. In 2021, Shaggy went on Vlad TV and clarified things. 
He explained that the reason he didn't end up working with Rihanna is because he wanted to do a studio session with her while her management just wanted him to send her some records to get on. And when he requested a studio session, he was told due to scheduling, it wouldn't be possible. Another fact about Shaggy that's mentioned nowadays is the fact that he's the father of rapper Rob Banks. Fortunately, in the beginning, Rob Banks and Shaggy didn't necessarily have the best relationship. And Shaggy didn't even know that his son was a rapper until he was already successful with a fan base. At the same time, Rob Banks was always keeping hush about the fact that Shaggy was his father for obvious reasons. In the current day, however, they're on better terms and Shaggy makes it clear how proud he is of his son. While it's not the early 2000s anymore, Shaggy is still doing his thing today. He linked up with Sean Paul and Spice on the track Go Down Day in 2021, which saw quite a bit of streaming success. He still tours and he's made quite a few movie appearances, most recently in the movie Game Over Man. In 2022, he also dropped a collaborative album with Sting called Come Fly With Me. At the end of the day, you gotta remember that Shaggy's a legend. He helped get Dancehall to where it is today, alongside other artists like Sean Paul and Shabba Ranks. He's well respected back home in the Caribbean and abroad. One thing I do wish about Shaggy was during his peak, I wish he was a little more collaborative. I would have liked to see a few more big features on his album, as well as see him do more features for other people. What are your guys' thoughts on Shaggy? Are you fans of his music? Do you still bump it? Do you have memories listening to Shaggy? Let us know in the comments. It's been your boy DJ T-Stomp, and I'm out. Peace.